to change that mindset of we can't do it to yes, we can do it, um, caused everybody to better understand how we all work together, how those pieces of the puzzle make us who we are come the end of the day. A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari Santiago, president of IT Direct. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Made in America podcast. Today, I'm with Karen McWirt, president of Prospect Machine Products, who also happens to be a former executive director of SMA. She's got a super interesting history in manufacturing out and then back in again. I'm so excited to hear her story and share it with the audience. Karen. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, Ari. Well, listen, it's the Made in America podcast, so we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Um, we're a contract a deep draw manufacturer. Brought a few of our samples here today. Um, a lot of people aren't familiar with the process. Um, and just to kind of describe it a little bit, in my very technical terms, um, we take metal and we treat it as if it was like bubble gum. <laughs> and if you stretch bubble gum too fast, it breaks. Right. If you pull your bubble gum apart slowly, it will mold into something different. So we stretch our metal and make our parts. So you make bubble gum do things that, I mean, you make metal do things that only bubble gum could do in people's That's right. minds. That's really awesome. What is the, what was a typical end use of a metal drawn product? Um, it's varied. There are some deep draw uh, places that We'll do cosmetics, um, battery cans. We happen to provide parts to the auto industry, um, to the bearing companies for valves, um, some medical, and um, just some general use uh, security systems. So nice to be able to be diversified, got a lot of different areas that yes. you, can, uh, you can work in. That's fantastic. So I love to talk about the why. So why does Prospect Machine Products exist? What's the history behind that? Well, I think like most manufacturers in the state of Connecticut, there's a story to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, our founder, uh, Michael Pugliese, and his wife, Connie, um, started our company back in 1950. At the time when he started the company, he was a full-time tool and die maker. And his employer was selling some screw machines. And he got the idea that it would be a good idea and a good project for him. Um, he didn't have any storage space for it, so he put the four screw machines in the chicken coop, okay. and that's where they ran them. Um, and in bringing some of the rod through, they had to cut holes in the side of the building because it couldn't <laughs> fit in the chicken coop. <laughs> it was a quite unique setup, to say the least. Um, the family, which consisted of three daughters and a son, had the opportunity to help with cleaning and packing and sorting um, the product because it was always an after hours um, project for them. Uh, eventually, he purchased property behind his home, built the facility that we are in today. Um, he lived to the ripe young age of 99. And in 1982, um, he sold the business to one of his daughters. Um, she made a wonderful mark for women in manufacturing, she tripled the company's sales. Um, and also made the brave decision to focus the company's attention just on the transfer press side of the business and got out of the competitive side of the um, screw machine business, having realized that they couldn't compete and mm -hmm. what was happening in both arenas. Um, the company then was sold to her brother-in-law in, let's see, 2008. And he's our current current owner. Oh wow! Yeah. So we're kind of on our third uh, ownership, kind of like a little bit in the family on a roundabout. Uh, yeah. On a roundabout kind of way. And so, does the business still do what the original founder's daughter transitioned it to do? Or yes. That this, so this deep draw metal was what she called Waterberry Ferrells. Waterberry Ferrells still <laughs> making it, still making yeah. it happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's really great. Well, how did you get involved? So I think, you know, uh, we talked a little bit before uh, before right. the show, and I know, as I sort of said in the intro, you've been in manufacturing, you're out sort of back in again. So Karen, let's just kind of talk through what uh, what's, your what's your story? Well, I would say I was in manufacturing from the time I was born. 
Um, my father worked in manufacturing. Um, I have to also say, I had no idea what he did. <laughs> um, he just would be home for dinner at five o'clock. I knew that. Um, it ended up that later on, I obviously learned that he was also an accountant in manufacturing. So when I was going to school, one of my internships was to go to Remington Arms with him. And that's where I learned to use a calculator without looking at the buttons because <laughs> I sat for hours after hours just adding up columns of numbers <laughs> on that lovely green paper that some people probably don't even know what it looks like anymore. <laughs> um, Free spreadsheets for those <laughs> that's of <right>. us. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I graduated from college, I went into manufacturing, um, worked at a few different companies up in the northwest corner of the state. Um, early Always in kind of the front office in the accounting county. area. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes doing the tax accounting, the cost accounting. Did you get one of those managers. visors, one of those green? And the rubber stains. And the rubber. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yes. All right, cool. That guy loved um, it. One of the jobs, and I first started, um, the woman who sat next to me did accounts receivable. And she had all of her little ledger books. And then she had her big ledger books so that after she would log everything in her little ledger books, she would put them in the big ledger book. <laughs> And it would now be a month and a half later, and we still wouldn't really know what our receivables were. <laughs> so one of my jobs as a general accountant there was to convert it to an automated system, which we put on a PC. And I never understood why the woman never spoke to me again, <laughs> 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 because we would be able to get our aging, you know, in a timely basis. Sure. Um, which is kind of important, I would say. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and accurate, too, which yeah, is equally you nice. Timely and accurate. Amazing. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, um, in the early 90s, uh, there was a lot of right-sizing in manufacturing, and I found myself out of a job. Um, sort of an impact of NAFTA-type decisions? Like, do you remember what was sort of driving that? Um, it was just a change in what our market was. At the time, I was working for a company that was making soda dispensing equipment, mm -hmm. and um, I think they decided that they could be more efficient and didn't need as many people. Mm -hmm. um, so when my accounting manager returned from maternity leave, I got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that led me to a new opportunity. Um, I then went into banking, um, tried my hand at that. Remember starting there and being told that I'd have to work there for a few years before I could say I was a banker. <laughs> um, very, very hierarchical environment. Mm -hmm. um, and then I left there and went back to a little bit of manufacturing, but it wasn't the right mix. So did a little more banking and then said, you know, I just really want to do something different. And that's the beauty of having an accounting degree because you can work in a lot of different places. There's numbers in lots of places. So I, yeah, I say every business probably has a need for that accounting right, function. Right? Whether they're profit, nonprofit. Exactly. So they're going, I, they're going to stay in business anyway. anyway. Exactly. So I um, started working nonprofit. And it was only a part-time job. And one of our board of uh, directors knew of an opportunity with the SMA and said, this might just be the right match for you. Get two part-time jobs. Hardest thing I ever did in my entire life. There is no such thing as a part-time job. So yeah. having two part-time jobs was just near job, to impossible. Like, well, is, that, is that a job and a half? <laughs> I mean, right. So. Right. Somebody's always thinking you're spending more time on the other person's <laughs> job than their job. Um, but that worked out because that in turn led me to the opportunity to go to Prospect Machine Products. Um, when Mary Pavone was retiring and um, looking to fill the accounting um, role and her human resource person was also retiring, uh, she had sent me a job description. As the, was the owner of Prospect at the time? Um, no, she had actually sold the business already to Richard. Okay. But um, it was her role. So oh, that's gotcha. why she was pursuing filling it and said, you know, I don't know if you know anybody who is in manufacturing um, or has an accounting degree, but we have an opportunity here. And I said, well, actually, I really do. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, you're kidding. And even though she had met me through my role as executive director in the SMA, she didn't realize that was what my background was. So it was a perfect match. And um, I joined them in 2012. Haven't looked back. It's my home away from home. Um, it's just a great place to be. What is kind of, you know, you've, you've, you know, manufacturing obviously grew up sort of around it. Then you were in it out and back. Like what keeps drawing you back? What's kind of, what, what's kind of excites you about it? Um, the challenge. 
Um, it isn't the same every day. Um, it's ever changing. There's opportunities for improvement. Um, you can take your job in manufacturing in so many directions, whether you're talking about diversifying who you're selling to, how you're going to process your product, um, to what are we going to do to just make some more money for the bottom line by what we're trying to accomplish. Um, that's the part that intrigues me. That sort of variety being the spice of life kind of a, yeah. kind of a thing. So, you know, having been in and out for so long, it's just not something we've really talked about on the podcast, but it's something that certainly interests me, which is what, how has it changed in your view in all the years? I mean, obviously some computer stuff, but what have you seen in Connecticut manufacturing that's evolved since you first got introduced to it? Certainly the role in what women play in manufacturing has changed. Um, Previously, that was a clerical position. Um, you might be working in whatever department, but you were doing clerical activity. You you weren't the manager. That has changed in a lot of places. Um, I think that was pretty true across the board. Like if you, no matter where you were, you were doing clerical work, not supervisory work, not production work, sort of right. relegated to the the paper and the pencil. Or if you were doing anything in production, it would be light assembly. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, sitting over there working on whatever you were supposed <laughs> to be working on. Um, the other thing that I think is is changed quite a bit um, is the way people process things and, and the impact that Lean has had on businesses. Um, I know for me, having been out and coming back in, that was something that I needed to go to school to learn more about because it wasn't in place when I initially was working in manufacturing. So where did you go to learn about it? Uh, to Constep. And how did that work out? It was awesome. It was a great program. Could you share your experience? I think there's, you know, just the reason I'm <clears> going <throat> to dig on this a little bit is I think that there's so many great resources in Connecticut to help our manufacturers excel. And not everyone either knows about them or maybe knows, but isn't sure, is it really going to work for me? Uh, so it seems like you got something out of it. So I wonder if you could share with the audience. What was <clears throat> yeah. your experience? Um, in general, Constep, I think, is a tremendous help to the manufacturing environment, especially the smaller manufacturers who might not have that expertise amongst their staff. And that was the case for us at um, Prospect Machine. Um, we knew we needed to do something, but we didn't know how to go about doing that. Um, by going to the class, interacting with other colleagues from different industries, hearing about what their challenges are, you learn, wow, we're having the same problem. It isn't, it isn't magic, okay? You do try to ride um, roll out 5S and have everybody do it for a week and then go back to their own routine. I thought it was only our place that had that problem, you know? Um, so I think that that was helpful. Um, one of the other areas that became very impactful for us was the utilization of how to truly manage our production. Um, we used to go into a production meeting I actually got to start going first, not because I was involved in production, but from an HR standpoint point, to keep the arguments down. <laughs> because <laughs> keep the, the fifth cost to a minimum. Right, yeah. The materials guy and the manufacturing supervisor, you know, it was always the other guy's fault. Mm -hmm. um, but we also would do it at the end of the week. By the way, that's probably a problem many people also have at their yes. organization. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, then there was this huge wall too, because there's the shop and there's the office mm -hmm. and um, the two aren't supposed to blend. I'd like to think that we've improved that as well. But um, at the time, it was always after the fact. It wasn't, it wasn't current. Um, if there was a need to run overtime, oh, it's too, too late to ask anybody to work. How are we going to do that? Oh, I didn't know that machine needs a repair. It was always catching up, um, reactive, not proactive. Um, I also think that the concept of bringing in different people when we started our production meetings, help bring the group closer because the people who are really doing the work are the ones that really get to participate in the process. Um, it isn't the supervisor looking to discuss what he thinks is important. It's the person who's working on that machine that can discuss what their problems are, their challenges, or maybe what their successes are. Um, so I think that that's created 
greater camaraderie amongst the team as well. And those are all things that you think you picked up from the concept, concept classes. Yeah. That's tremendous. Um, let's take a step back. You talked about 5S, and I think what you talked about is something, listen, connects with me, and I am sure it connects with a lot of the listeners, right? You come out there, you spend all this time, you work on it, you think it's good, and then you check in a month later, and we are back to where we were before we had the conversation. What have you done and seen to be successful to avoid that kind of cycle back to the beginning to make these things stick? The person leading the charge had to change um, from the perspective that I could say, yes, we need to implement 5S. Our manufacturing engineer could say that, but it wasn't until the owner of the company made it a priority that we were able to successfully implement it. Um, even now, he, with COVID and whatever, has not been in as frequent, um, and it started to slide. Really? And so um, we had company coming this week, and we had to go back to our old way and post up the sign, everybody's got to clean up, we're having <laughs> company come. Um, we don't normally have to do that if everybody's doing their 5S, um, if people are signing off on it, if they know they're going to be checked. Um, but it's just like your kid in their bedroom, Okay. You can tell them to clean it, they'll clean it. But if you don't remind them that they still need to do it, it goes back to the way it was. I think we can all also connect <laughs> with that analogy uh, super well mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, uh, man, there's just so much great stuff. The other thing I'm going to ask you about related to what you talked about for a concept was that wall, which in so many places is true, right? There's physical barrier typically between the front office and then production um, or in some cases, right, to keep the noise down or whatever, right. that that's real. But that wall becomes more than just a physical barrier. It becomes a communication barrier and you can get the animosity even in, you know, and I know Prospect Machine is a relatively small company, but it doesn't really matter, right? Whether you're 15 people or 500, these barriers or silos, whatever you want to call them, you know, they crop up. And then to your point, it's the, is it the purchasing guy? Is it the production? Is it, oh, they didn't, the sales didn't quote it right, or they didn't give them the right design, or that wasn't the price we agreed to, or how could we possibly get that? That many parts out in that short period of time, you know, blah, blah, blah. So what have you guys, what have you seen to be successful to help break down those silos? Getting to know your people, getting to communicate with everyone so that they understand the importance of each person's role in the organization. Um, it's very easy for the person in the shop to not have any idea what the role of the person in the office is doing and how that is or isn't impacting their job. Um, I mean, a lot of the terminology is your internal and your external customers. Um, because we are so small, we don't get caught up in a lot of that jargon, okay? Um, it's more over, no, this person is doing this, which causes the impact to you doing here. Um, it's sharing the challenges and the successes of each group. Um, it's, to your point, very easy for the person to assume the other person isn't doing their part, but until they better understand why that person has that challenge or where we need to help in order to get over a hurdle together. Uh, a couple years ago, we had a new customer who we were very excited about had awarded us 10 new jobs, which for us, 10 new jobs in a year is unheard of. And of course, the sales guy He's, he's happy. Look at what I did. And, you know, he's, you know, this is great. We're going to do this. And of course, as it starts to trickle through the organization, the fear, fear. factor. Oh, yeah. How are we going to do this? How is this going to be accomplished? Um, I get the separate meetings of people come in, you know, we can't do this. You're going to have to talk to the sales guy about the dates. There's no way we can do this. And um, it served as a wonderful tool for us because we did do it. Mm. Um, and, to change that mindset of we can't do it to yes, we can do it, um, caused everybody to better understand how we all work together, how those pieces of the puzzle make us who we are come the end of the day. That's fantastic. I mean, do you have any tips of how, I mean, so many great tips you had right there of breaking down those silos, doing the communication. You know, one of the things that stuck out in my mind that you said was, and this isn't how you said it, but I'll paraphrase uh -huh. and sort of say, it's so helpful to have someone walk a mile in the other person's shoes. Mm -hmm. Very easy from my perch to feel the other person didn't do their role or impute some motive into them. They don't understand what have you. And and sort of, but once you walk a mile in their shoes and see their perspective, all of a sudden it changes. 
how do you do that? You know, what do you do? Um, obviously you can't make your production supervisor salesman for a month, or at least maybe you can, I don't know. Um, but how do you help people to see that other perspective? Um, I think admitting that you don't know is the first step you need to take. Um, don't assume, and we all know what that's an abbreviation of, um, that you know that person's job or you know where their challenges are. Um, when my role in the company changed and I took on some additional responsibilities as far as managing our production, it was unrealistic for me from my accounting seat to feel that I knew what the challenges of our tool makers were, that I didn't understand why if my piece of paper says 20 hours for a setup, why aren't they doing that? What is causing them other issues? And I think that if you say you don't know and you start to share and then I, in turn, can share, well, when you don't do it in this amount of time, this is the problems that it causes me from a financial standpoint. It allows people to better understand how their roles interact. Bring that beginner's mind, the, the right. curio approach with curiosity yeah. instead of with assumption and get there. Do you, have you sent staff to trainings, whether it's Concept or anyone else or brought people in to kind of help filter that beginner's mind, that curiosity, that approach through the organization, or is it something that a small handful of people have gone and then tried to, you know, sort of bring that information? It's, it's been more of a few people and then disseminating the information. Um, that being said, I think with a lot of the changes to a lot of the virtual programming that is now available, um, it's much easier for us to be more inclusive in doing that. Um, one of the challenges, obviously, in manufacturing is if you're physically not there, you're not making parts. Mm, yep. And how do you justify pulling somebody away from that aspect to give them that opportunity? And by not having to travel to another state, stay overnight and break things up into modules, I mean, it's been very helpful for us to get more people involved and learning from a different source so that you don't sound like you're the Charlie Brown going wah, 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 but somebody else can hear what you're saying. Totally. I, you listen, I, <laughs> that, I super connect with that. I mean, I, I've been, I've been super guilty of going to a seminar or learning something, come back here, hair on fire, ready to try something new. And, you know, that's usually not a great way to get things done, but sort of, you know, bringing people to the same expert to hear it directly. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh, we have this great idea. And you could say, perfect, right. you know, let it go. And I, that's, you know, something you said, I really uh, excited me, which was, this idea that this innovation that we're that's being thrust upon us because of of the pandemic, there is some really good that can come out of this. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, and you just really articulated super well, is this idea that why didn't we innovate this training? Because you're not the only person that thinks, my goodness, I have to take someone who has to then be gone for extra time, even if you're just driving to Hartford or New Haven or Stanford, you know, that could be three hours of of travel time for a one hour or a four hour seminar. It's a full day where if you break it up into modules, two hours at a clip, and all I have to do is go to a conference room with a webcam and a TV. Wow, I can I could skill up my staff so much faster. It's kind of exciting. Yeah. And I think that it's also um more interactive because you can have your peers there with you mm -hmm. um having that discussion because I know other training that we have done has been modules um, you know, in front of the computer, that's fine. It's still now you and the computer. You don't get that interactive um, discussion about um, the applications that you might be seeing um, in the training. Yeah. So bringing other people from the organization. So now you're like triple value, right? It's right. saving on the travel plus getting more people direct from the source. And now we're, we're in it, we're in it together instead yes. of uh, apart. And everyone has that same experience. And you don't get the, oh, why did they get Choose chosen and I <laughs> didn't get to go. Yeah, right. We, had, <laughs> we all know that dance, right? Explaining that when's your turn and all that stuff. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's really terrific. Uh, uh, you know, what do you think? You know, t talking about sort of just lean at the highest level. What's your view on how lean's been able to make your prospect machine more valuable to your customers? Um, especially working in the automotive sector. Um, they always want to hear how you're going to drop your price. So by utilizing some lean techniques, you are cutting out your waste. So you are able to be more profitable at a lower amount. Um, it might mean taking what was an outside operation and figuring out how you can integrate it 
into your initial process of going through the press. Um, it might like recognizing the fact that you can't be good at everything. In our situation, um, that had to do with cleaning our parts. Um, our systems were antiquated. It was a backlog. Um, and we ended up sending all of our cleaning out. Allow somebody else to be the expert. Mm -hmm. Focus on what you can be the expert on. Um, those are some of the areas that it's had the most tremendous impact for so us. So looking back through the lean journey and the time that you've spent, you feel like it's driven value to Prospect Machine and to your customers as oh, well? Oh, definitely. Super successful. Yeah. So, you know, something else that you talked about, um, which is so resonates with me, is the idea of being with peers. There's something about being a business leader that can be super lonely. You know, uh, everyone I think knows, or certainly in my view, good leaders know, you never complain down. You always complain up. Well, when you get to a certain place and you look up and there's nobody up there, uh, that becomes problematic. And then you're stuck with maybe your spouse. And that's never, that is <laughs> never a good, a good, a good thing. So, um, so talk about how you feel being around peers and, and how, how, how that's helped you. Maybe talk about how it's helped you if it has personally in terms of your career and broadening your perspective and how it's helped the business. Um, Peers are critical to one's success, um, whether it be a SMA meeting that you go to and you're meeting a few more people, or whether you're serving on a board of another organization, once again, interacting with um, other people. Example that I'll even use is I was on a uh, conference call the other day and we were waiting for a few um, people to join. That conversation that gets started initially, and it's like back as we said before, oh, you too have that problem? <laughs> you know, and it's all of a sudden, oh, phew, I'm not alone. Um, and I think that it then creates a relationship where you start calling people up and saying, hey, I'm just touching base. How are things going? What's your challenges? What did you do with this? Have you used this program? Um, oh, no, I haven't. Can you tell me more about it? Um, I think that's where a lot of that has helped, especially with a lot of the um, special grants that were issued for manufacturing. It's trying to stay abreast of that and do your job sometimes <laughs> is a challenge, to say the least. <laughs> say the least. So if you have those connections, somebody sends you that information, okay? Um, the PPP most recently, I think, is another example where sharing amongst your peers was a very helpful process. Sure, how to maximize that, what counts, what doesn't count. It was changing and confusing. Exactly. Easy, easy, to, easy to miss something. Um, I got so many questions I want to ask you. So I think I'm going to do SMA right now, I, you know, because you just sort of touched on it. You know, as a former executive director at SMA and an SMA member mm -hmm. now, can you, well, I guess first, why don't we tell people what SMA is in case anybody doesn't know. Let's Smaller there. Manufacturers Association of Connecticut. Um, it is a business group focused solely for manufacturers. That isn't to say that all of our members are manufacturers, um, but the bylaws do require that to be the majority of the membership. Mm -hmm. um, providing services to the members as far as new topics that are coming on, um, working in the educational area, working in the legislative area. Um, so pretty well-rounded been around for quite some time. Absolutely. I think SMA is the second name even. I think originally it was like the Waterbury Manufacturers yeah. or something like that. Um, and I know SMA is a part of the Connecticut Manufacturers Collaborative, the, yes. the CMC. So um, from your perch as former executive director and now as a member, what's some value that you think people get by being a member of SMA? Well, I think you touched on it earlier when you talked about colleagues and peers. Um, but I think it's also helpful for the educational side of it. Um, we have also utilized um, that relationship to better understand the apprenticeship program, involvement with the tech schools within the state. Um, it's very customary for us at Prospect Machine to have an apprentice. A lot of them start when they can start at 16 as a work-based program. Um, without that connection to the SMA, you might not know that the way about to even get involved. Um, because SMA stays in touch with those schools, you have that win-win both for the members as well as for the students. So, yeah, super critical. And, uh, you know, listen, I'm, I personally have that benefited in my life and in my career immensely, not just in the success I've had in business, but so many personal relationships and personal assistance that I've gotten through peer relationships and peer groups that I've been in. So I'm a, I'm mm -hmm. a big fan. Um, so maybe just quickly you could 
you know, give a pitch for someone who isn't a member of, you know, their local manufacturers association or whatever, like why, why should someone join? Why should they take their time and their money and put it in that area? It's worthwhile. It's going to give, pay you back tenfold. Um, there's almost too many elements that you could gain from joining um, without sounding cliche. But once again, to talk to somebody who maybe had a similar problem, came up with a resolution, or let's say there's a new standard coming out, having the opportunity to get some free, for all intents and purposes, without hiring the consultant, some better understanding or training of that idea um, to get greater awareness about what programs are available for manufacturing and just in general to further support manufacturing in the state of Connecticut. Completely. Yeah, no, I think you've hit the right on the nose there. Super. I, listen, the ROI, in my view, on getting involved is tremendous. And uh, the most important thing is to start, right? And yeah. to attend the meetings, right? Because if you don't do that, you're not getting anywhere. And I think in particular for small companies, um, having that relationship, and I, I think you'll agree, but certainly tell me if I'm off base, it's almost like getting an extension of your business. And you know, you can't, you can't be on, it's hard to be on top of the changing rules and the laws and the this and the that, and then what's out there for programs you mentioned and how to maximize my relationship with the schools. When you're a small company, you're just trying to get the bills paid, keep things running. Plus you've got now lean and 5S and just like all the different things. Who has time to go to the, the tech schools? But it's important to do that. Who has time to go to the capital and make sure that manufacturer needs are being heard? Like it's hard to do that. And I think by being a part of these groups, we almost add on these tools to without our company without having to hire them. Yeah. Yes. So um, that's great. I, I, you know, you said something earlier, which I, I love to talk about. I think diversity is so important. Um, I think where there, where there is more diversity of thought um, and experience, uh, we get better outcomes. And I think that's been proven in study after study. And I think racial diversity, gender diversity, background, everything, you know, and even in a business, when you, you talked about before getting, when you have a sales thing or you're trying to do a program, getting people from, you know, from purchasing, from materials management, from sales, from production to talk together and have those experiences. And in particular, you talked about the changing role of women in manufacturing. And I just, I don't know, maybe you could elaborate on, on how you've seen that change happen, you know, what's driving it and what you see kind of coming down the road for women's role in manufacturing. Well, I'm going to start by reflecting on a, a recent change for us at um, Prospect. Um, we needed a, a machine operator. It's um, a very critical job for us. Mm -hmm. If a machine operator does their job, makes everybody else's job better. Um, I like to use analogies, and I often will equate it because of my banking background to the role of the teller in the bank. You don't really care who's the president of the bank. If that teller messes up your transaction, that's what you remember. Um, the machine operator works the same way, for me at least, in our manufacturing environment. And we recently hired a new machine operator. Um, she is a career machine operator. And what I mean by that is she has over 16 years of um, deep draw experience. And as I went to my lead toolmaker telling him of her hire, he was ecstatic. And the reason he was ecstatic is he says, women do that job so much better than men. He says they pay attention to detail. You can read their writing. They don't mind having to do many things or used to balancing many things. And I think that that's what's led to the role changing in manufacturing is realizing what strengths women could bring to that environment. Um, we're used to juggling many things. That's just our life. <laughs> Um, we're used to things changing at a spur of the moment and having to react to it. Um, and as a result, in order to do a lot of those things, we have a tendency to be very organized and disciplined in what our activities are. Yeah, so you've seen it. And and so do you feel that as it stands today in manufacturing, when you go to SMA meetings or if you've gone to Constep, that women are as welcome and open arms as anybody else's? Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, and I, I look at our company, okay, and, and how we're very small, but where we have strategically placed women, um, myself as president, our machine operator, our quality person, our sales area. I mean, there really isn't a portion of our business that isn't impacted by women being involved. Well, yeah, that's really, uh, <laughs> that's really tremendous. And it just sounds like something that's happened organically 
Is that fair? Or, yeah, yeah, definitely. Just, and it's working. Yes. <laughs> yeah, dude, we absolutely love that. So let's. You mentioned kind of hiring a machine operator, somebody with 16 years experience in your specific space. So a lot of manufacturers hearing that are like drooling at how right. did you do that? <laughs> so talk about your thought process at uh, you know at Prospect Machine about recruiting and hiring. Do you guys have a specific approach to it? Like how do you how do you guys think about recruiting and and, and hiring? Um, we utilize Indeed. Okay. That has been a a big success for us. Um, but I think that the other thing that came into play, especially with the machine operator position, was giving credit where credit was due, um, recognizing the importance of that position, paying accordingly for that skill set, mm -hmm. understanding that that job has evolved from what it used to be as well. Um, things like the ins online inspection, the SPC, um, that wasn't necessarily as much of their job as moving the scrap bucket or getting some additional material. Um, yes, there's still some of those elements, but once again, you know, in the area of scrap, we changed our process so they weren't spending their time walking around the building moving garbage. <laughs> you know, scrap is scrap. That's right. Um, but having the time, setting up their location so that they could do their paperwork accordingly, um, I think that that came into the whole recruiting and better explaining what the job entailed, um, what you were looking for. And once again, I have to say that I um, do a lot of peer contact when we're looking for somebody. Um, you never know who somebody has seen recently or knows of somebody. Um, we do have a program with our employees that if they find us somebody um, and they work out and they're there six months later, there's a monetary um, payment made to them as a very big thank you mm -hmm. um, because it is a thank you. It is very hard to find um, qualified people. Um, it's hard to find the person that doesn't have the misconception about what manufacturing is. Um, and they're not willing to make that choice to join the group. No, listen, totally. Some of your best customers can come from customer referrals. Some of our best employees can come from employee referrals. And I right. think it, recognizing how important that is, is really strong. You've talked about a lot of stuff in our conversation so far about like technology has changed, even going back to your first sort of spreadsheet <laughs> setup. Um, you know, where are you guys leveraging technology a lot today, a prospect machine that may be a surprise to listeners? In marketing. Mm. Um, our sales manager was out doing the typical visit the customer and had a prospective customer in the area, made a phone call. Hi, I'm in the area. Can I come over? Stop in. Answer was no. <laughs> and he was very taken back by that. He's a very nice person. Why, why couldn't I stop in to say hello? And looking at it, we realized that the group of people that we were trying to connect with realistically did not want to see us. They didn't want to really want to talk to us. So we made a very big push to go with digital um, marketing. Um, we have a chat room on our website. We redesigned our website. We have an SEO that we work with to keep our website active, alive. Um, and in the last three years, that is how we've attracted all of our new customers. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. One hundred. One hundred percent. All coming in through uh, through online. Wow, that's exciting. so. What I mean, so it was just recognizing that the buyers have changed. Like, what drove, what drove that? And was there pushback internally? Was there fear about changing that? Um, no, um, our owner was very cognizant because he initially had started out with sales being his entrance into the <laughs> business. That there was a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. He knew that the website was important, but he didn't know how to leverage that. Um, so that's where the learning had to come in, um, talking to somebody about what is or isn't good content on your website, talking about the fact that you need to blog a couple times um, a month in order to get your ratings up, having somebody who had the ability to <clears throat> monitor and manage how many clicks on a page, what page were they looking at, how often did they stay those were all critical pieces of information that we needed to better understand that we weren't even looking at. Right. Yeah. Well, this is all about, it's all about learning new stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and are you guys leveraging, I mean, have you guys gotten into anything with either, you know, social media marketing, Facebook, LinkedIn, do you guys do any email campaigns or newsletters? Like, yeah, um, we, we do use LinkedIn. 
Um, we aren't on Facebook. Uh, we didn't see there there was a match for us. Um, but we do a LinkedIn direct campaigns. Um, we have found those to be very helpful um, because then that creates additional traffic for us. Mm -hmm. um, and with the uh, chat set up, we try to engage in talking um, to individuals at that stage of the game. Can you explain what the direct campaign is on LinkedIn for people that may not know? Oh, um, now you're going to an area that I'm not <laughs> well versed in. That's fine. Good enough. I get it. I get okay. it. That's somebody else's job. That's right. No one to delegate. Absolutely. Well, actually, that was kind of, I think, dovetails nicely. Uh, by the way, I just want to say this. I think that, you know, Connecticut's blessed by having this long history of manufacturing, and we've been a leader in manufacturing, you know, for a long, long time, and the Connecticut history of manufacturing goes back a long time. But so does Connecticut innovation, and I think we you've talked about lean, which I'm a big believer that you know companies that have invested in lean are the ones that are succeeding now. And I think the next kind of evolution is this information technology evolution, and it's got to be in part the marketing and the sales absolutely needs to be embraced. You know ERPs and the I4.0, like we've got to be, we have to lean into these changes and not be afraid of them if we want to continue to compete uh, in the years ahead. So I'm super happy that you that you brought that up. Um, can you talk a little bit about your job as president of Prospect Machine Products and what do you love about your job? Um, my job is very varied. Um, I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day activities. Um, and given our size, that means I get to purchase our raw materials. Mm -hmm. I get to schedule the work for production on the floor, working hand-in-hand -hand with really everybody else in the company to make my goal, which is the other part of my job, what our sales number is. <laughs> um, and then looking at the financial results to see if the activities that we have done have paid off for us and where we have opportunities to improve. And that's where my financial side comes in. And then additionally, I have the human resource responsibilities of looking at the insurances and whatever. Um, but that also, once again, goes back to bringing the group together, getting rid of the silos. Um, if I'm out there on the floor every day talking with our employees, you get to know everybody. You're not just sitting in your office. Mm -hmm. Um, which can be very boring. <laughs> yeah, nothing really, nothing really good happens when you stay in your office all day. I'd have right. to say it's a very bad, a very bad spot. Which do you? What do you like the most? Like what? Just for you, Karen, personally, like what charges you up the most for the stuff that you get to do? Numbers. Numbers. Everything. Girl, that, that everything accounting, is numbers. You're an accountant at heart. That's a right. good thing. Wherever we go, the numbers. Uh, the numbers. The numbers tell me the story. <laughs> and that's and that's where you like to yeah. be. How have you felt about the people part of it? You know, generally we always find there's like a pull and pull. People that love numbers sometimes struggle in the people part. How do you how do you embrace that? How have you found a way to embrace that? Um, I guess I go back to the fact that you can't do it alone. Mm. Okay, um, I could do all the numbers in the world. But if I don't have somebody to share them with, to talk about what they mean, what good are they? They're just something on a piece of paper. Um, the human element is part of the success. Um, without our people, there's nothing. nothing. Yeah, listen, that's a, that's a, that's the truest one of the truest things you said. Um, what about what about the culture at Prospect Machine? You know, for people who maybe are listening to this podcast who aren't in manufacturing yet, but are wondering like, what is it like to work in manufacturing in Connecticut? From your experience at Prospect Machine, what's it like to work in manufacturing there? Um, it's very open. It's very welcoming. Um, there's 15 of us, so we're an overgrown family. Mm -hmm. um, and like most families, that means some days we all get along and some days we don't. Um, but we learn from that. I mean, and and life goes on from that. Um, I think that was part of our culture is to learn how to express ourselves about what we were thinking without it becoming confrontational. Okay. Um, understanding and hearing that other person's um, approach or concerns with something. Um there aren't any silos. Um, everybody has some part in our success. That's our overall culture. Come in, get to feel like part of the family, make a difference, turn something into something else that does some good in the world. It's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty compelling story you guys got going over there. Yeah, that's a uh, that's pretty exciting. So as we start to like kind of wrap up a little bit, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. You know, it's it's always hard, I think, as the president of an organization to help determine where to invest. 
right? If we want our businesses to grow and be relevant in the future, we have to invest. And there's always competing priorities. And then there's things we don't expect like pandemics. Um, when you think about investing in Prospect Machine so that you guys can continue to be relevant for the next 70 years, how do you think about where to invest and make those decisions for the business? Um, I first start thinking about people, okay? I then look at our technology um, and I look at our processes. Um, those are the keys in my mind that we have to focus on. Um, the rest will follow. Um, I don't get nervous about where's that next customer coming from because I feel if we're doing those other items, the customers will come. I love how you started with the people. So is it, it's people, technology, and then process. You've talked so much about about people, where along the way did it kind of click for you? Just how important it is to value your people, to invest in them? Like, where have you, is that something that was innate? Have you seen when someone didn't do that and it didn't work? Have you seen yeah. that you have? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be lying if I said otherwise. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I mean, I guess that just realizing, even if you're working just in the accounting department, there isn't just one job in the accounting department. There's multiple jobs in the accounting department. So you realize very early on that you have to share your activities and interact with others. Um, as my career grew and obviously as my priorities changed, it just became more and more apparent how critical the roles of the people that you were working are were to the overall success. Listen, I, you know, completely. And I think it's the one area that, I mean, sometimes it's hard to, you know, you hear people talk about how hard it is to invest in people and make those decisions. Should I take them off the line to go get training and all that stuff? But I, I have to tell you my experience, and I'm interested if you agree, I've never regretted helping someone that works for me get better. Oh, not at all. That's one of the greatest rewards as a manager, I think, that you can have is to, to provide that person with that opportunity to grow, um, whether it be financially, whether it be in their skill set, whether it just be their overall emotional place where they are in life. Um, second chances, we all need them. Absolutely. Listen, it's one of the greatest rewards of being able to be own a business, I think, is or run a business is to be able to see and help people learn and grow. That's awesome. Karen, I'm going to move us to our rapid fire round of questions. Oh, boy. <laughs> are, you, are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. All right, here we go. Red Sox or Yankees? Yankees. Starbucks or Duncan? Duncan. Uh, when you take time off outside of COVID, staycation or exotic destination? Exotic all the time. All the time. Ooh, <laughs> I like that. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Sports car or SUV? SUV to get to those locations. That's right. If you're going to go exotic, <laughs> got to have the all-wheel drive. Yeah, that's right. um, if you could do anything other than be president of Prospect Machine and you had to, and it could be anything in the entire world, what would you do? I would probably do gardening. Gardening? Yes. Why? Um, I get a great sense of accomplishment, um, whether it be the little plant that grows big or whether it be the yucky leaves that you cleaned out of someplace and now it looks <laughs> nice. To, I find it very therapeutic um, and enjoyable. There you go. I think my mom might have given the same answer. Do you have a, a favorite business book? No. No. Well, what's one thing, Karen, that you learned early in your career that you think has helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Um, aside from the importance of people, I think that I had to learn that everybody wasn't driving or pushing as hard or as fast as I might have been at the time. Um, I had to learn patience, I guess, is a translation of that, um, so that I wasn't aggravated with a coworker because they didn't see the need to get to where I thought we needed to be. How did you, how did, I'm going to ask this question because I, maybe I could probably learn from this. How did you like, I don't know what the right word is, actuate that patience? Like what do you tell yourself or how do you kind of work around that to not get that frustration when someone isn't putting, you know, moving that pace? I think initially I just had to put myself in timeout, <laughs> <laughs> count to 10, regroup, um, but I think that to learn that patience was understanding where they were coming from, what was on their mind at the time, why they didn't agree with what I wanted to do, um, as opposed to 
saying, no, this is what has to be done. I mean, there's always times I think that you have to take that approach, but it isn't always that you have to take that approach. Take your battles. What's one thing that you learned, Karen, later in your life or later in your career that if you went back and told young Karen and she listened to you, <laughs> which, you know, maybe, right. um, would have springboarded her career? Probably to be more open and honest with myself, who I was, where I wanted to head, what I wanted to become. Can you elaborate on that? You just, you didn't, you weren't willing to. Um, I think that I didn't ever stop to think about a direction, to think about what I could realistically do. I kind of just did the path, you know, go to school, graduate from school, get a job, you know, get married, have kids. And I didn't stop to invest in Karen to say, Karen, what do you want to do? And I think that that would have been something that might have been helpful. Well, I'll tell you what, maybe <laughs> maybe it wouldn't help, but you've landed in a really great place. And it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on, um, hearing all your experiences and all your sharing everything that you've done. It has been tremendous. And I think the audience is going to get a lot out of this episode. So thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. It's been great. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.